This is part two of our two-part series on the Brewbill Brew Sculptures. In part one, if you've missed it, please check out the video link here. But we go over all the components of what makes the brew sculpture. Today, we're gonna go over your brew day, or even actually the day before your brew day and your brew day. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment on this video. It helps us get visibility. Let us know what you think. All right, Chris, so we're gonna brew tomorrow. We've got our recipe all ready. We got our grains, we got our hops. My yeast starter's ready to go. What are we gonna do to prepare for brew day? The first thing I like to do is on the control panel, I go to the help and I see the delayed start feature, which is awesome. Meaning we can set this up to turn on. I do it about four in the morning, it starts heating. That way I don't have to wake up and wait. When I wake up, I'm pretty much ready to go. So we are going to put our hot liquor into our hot liquor tank. Now, we like to do it where we're going in RO water and adding our chemicals back, or sometimes we're just doing filtered water and adding it in. But the first thing we have to decide is how much liquid to go in. And there's kind of two options. Vito, walk them through that. Yeah, so you got two, two options. You know, say we're doing 10 gallons of beer, we'll probably need about 18 gallons of water. Um, that would be like what I would call like a zero sum. So we're just, you know, exactly the amount of water it's gonna take for grain absorption, uh, you know, dead space, et cetera. Or you could, you know, go ahead and fill it and have that extra water. The nice thing about having the extra water is when it comes time for cleaning, you've got extra hot water ready to add some PBW to and get this thing all cleaned up. And to be honest, water is very inexpensive relative to the rest of the process. So having extra water is always a nice thing to have around, especially when it's warm. However, when it comes to sparging, we'll tell you kind of why you may have wanted to choose those two different ways. Good point. <laughs> so a major differentiator on these electric brew systems over the propane ones, we, we developed them so you only need a 30 amp circuit. So you can only run one element at a time. That's one of the reasons we have the oversized hot liquor tank. It's, it's a little different than let's say Vito, you run it off your propane, do you? Yeah, the nice thing about uh, or being able to fire is if I'm gonna do multiple batches in one day. So say I'm starting to hit my boil and I wanna add more water on there, but um, you know, not necessary if you're doing single batch. In this scenario, we are gonna be heating our mash water in the hot liquor tank, unlike Vito's system with propane where you'd heat up that water right in your mash tun. So that's why we build this oversized so that you could fit both the sparge water and the mash water all inside this one vessel. The first thing we're gonna do after our hot liquor is all warm and ready to go, it's now time to set up our hoses for the mash. And it's a simple concept. We are going to connect underneath the false bottom and we are gonna go down to our pump inlet. Then from the pump, then we're gonna run up to our heat exchanger that is in our hot liquor tank. Then from the out of that, we are gonna run to the in of the ultimate sparge arm. And what we're doing is we're taking nice fresh water underneath the false bottom through the pump, putting it through the heat exchanger. And this is where we have a differential of temperature. So we have, let's say a 148 mash ton, but we want to raise it to 151. And we have, let's say about 170 something degree hot liquor water so that we have a difference in temperature as it runs through that coil coming back into the ultimate sparge arm, recirculating through the grain bed and going through. It's a very gentle way to raise your temperature and it's very effective. What I love about this, this uh, technique as well is we're, we're kind of um, vorloffing as we do that. So you're constantly rinsing, you're gonna get greater efficiency and you're also gonna have cleaner wort. So instead of like a batch sparge where you're all doing it or one time, we're, we're constantly recirculating as we're heating it. So you're gonna just have this nice, clear, perfect wort. So we have our hoses all set up for the mash. We make sure our valves are open along the way. And now we actually set it up on the control panel. There's three built-in mash schedules, nice and easy, easy setup for you. Or you can either build your own and it gives you an ability to set up to five different 
mash uh, temperatures and times that it will hold for, or you can edit any of the preset ones to match exactly what you wanna do. And it'll walk you through and you literally just start mash and it starts the timers, starts heating, and it will get you to the temperature you set and then start a timer to hold till that next temperature. And once you hit there, it'll go to the next one and so forth. And then it'll buzz at you when it's done. And that's when it's time to sparge. I love having the ability to do these step mashes, you know, being able to do like a protein rest. Uh, if you're into hefts, doing an acid rest is a big thing to really accentuate that clove. So the ability to do all these steps is really cool and have it kind of ramp up for you and hit, you know, your, your beta amylase, all these different steps. This is just really neat. And again, like it does it soft and it's, it's constantly recirculating. So you're getting clean wort as well. And the last bit I'll put on there is I love to do a mash out to denature those enzymes to really, it really produces the clearest wort. Now, since we are doing it through a differential in temperature, you have to really ramp up your hot liquor tank to get you there. So I rarely say I'm gonna get all the way to the entire mash is 171 and hold that for 15 minutes. Cause in order to get this to 171, I gotta have this probably like 191, in which case at the end, I'm gonna have to top up with some cool water to cool it down again. So most of the time, as soon as I'm above probably 165, I start my timer. And that's usually where I'm going is above 165 for 10 to 15 minutes. And it works great, great efficiency and great clarity. So our mash is done. It's time to switch over from mashing to sparging. Super simple instructions are on the screen. All right, Chris, we've done our mash. It's time to sparge. What are we doing next? All right, this thing's gonna be beeping at you. So the first thing you wanna do is stop that and there's a little silence alarm. Very first thing you're gonna do is turn off the ball valve at the mash tun. And this is really complicated change. We are going to take the quick disconnect off here. It's warm, so be careful. Then we bring that input over to our hot liquor and open that valve. I know this was really complicated. And lastly, we are going to connect the mash tun outlet and the boil kettle inlet so that we can start filling up the boil as we start to sparge. So that line going from the mash tun to the boil kettle won't work for the whole sparge, but it's a real nice gentle way to start the sparge. Water is self-seeking levels wise, so it'll go through and you can control these ball valves really nicely. Somewhere through the sparge, you're gonna wanna switch to running the pump, meaning you'll come from the boil kettle down into the inlet of the pump, out of the pump, into the inlet of the boil kettle and control that flow in through the ball valve. But it's easier to kind of control gravity than it is the pump when you're trying to slow things down. Yeah, main thing you're trying to do is just kind of dial back at the very last point, which is going into the kettle and then match the water that's coming in with what's going out. So that takes ideally about 30 minutes to get the maximum efficiency out of your mash. So the nice thing about this configuration is as we start the sparge, we're also cleaning out our heat exchanger that we used in the mash. So the hot liquor is gonna come out, rinsing out the tubing, rinsing the pump, coming up into your heat exchanger, rinsing that, cleaning out the ultimate sparge arm. So it's just really a nice little system to maximize all those sugars and to clean it out for you. I've been brewing on these systems in one form or another for years. And I would say this is the part I tend to screw up the most if I'm not conscious of what I'm doing. So now I try to be a lot more careful in the sparge. I used to brew on a tippy dump system. That's gravity, yours is wonderful. It's, you just control that one little outlet valve and everything in the back end works because you have float switches that turn on and off pumps for you. But in this scenario, you're balancing flow and that's a little complicated. So that's my one bit of advice is if you're gonna overfill like most of us do, just take your time. Look at the fill rate and adjust accordingly. Hey, if you get over 15 minutes, you've done a great job. If you go over a half hour, that's okay, but you probably love diminishing returns. Use it a few times and you'll find that you'll nail it. All right, so we're, we're in our sparge. We got about three gallons of wort that's made its way over here, our first runnings. Uh, what should we do next, Chris? Well, you're gonna have to wait. 
only until that water gets above the float switch because we don't want to dry fire. Actually, you can't dry fire the electrical element. But as soon as that liquid's up above those and the float switch goes up, now we can start heating the electrical element because who wants to wait till it's all collected before you start heating it just like you would propane or electric it doesn't matter so i just hit the boil kettle on the control panel and now we can start adding voltage to that element and start the heat i actually just go all the way up but some people will be a little more gentle because it's concentrated ward at that point and go 50 percent Either way, it doesn't really matter. You're just trying to start that heating process. All right, so we're almost at our volume. We're, we're at you know, maybe 190 degrees by this point. We're getting close to a boil. What's next, Chris? All right, we click the end sparge button and now we come and close our valves off. And now it's time to boil. And really, because we started heating at the end of the sparge, we're pretty close and we can control our burner intensity for the potential boil over right here from the control panel, a nice safe distance away from your brew kettle. Need to be here though, can't be walking away. This is the part that as you're watching that foam build, you can easily control this up and down and control that boil perfectly. Say I'm doing like an old school IPA, I've got like a 60 minute edition, a 45 minute edition, a 30 minute edition, a 15 minute edition. How do I remember those? So you get to add a timer for the whole boil and for each edition up to five editions. So you can only have five, but a buzzer will buzz at each time and it'll keep buzzing until you silence alarm and it's reminding you of which edition you're going next. The other cool thing I love about this boil kettle is it has the Whirlpool uh, arm built in. Um, so whirlpooling is, is, is great for any type of beer, uh, mostly hoppy beers, but for any beer, mixing it up, getting all of that, that proteins and, and trube to settle out is important. Uh, so what we do is we're actually pulling from the bottom um, and, and there's a little uh, you know, maximizer in there that you could you know, raise up or down. So if you had a ton of hops in the bottom, you could raise it up a little. Um, then you're pulling from the bottom and then pumping back up through this. There's basically a little 90 in there that's, that's creating this, this whirlpool action. And as it starts to mix up, you know, you've added your Warflock template, so it's binding with those proteins and they're all settling out right in the middle. So the whirlpool is key to not only hoppy beers, but just having nice clean wort going into your fermenter. While you're whirlpooling, it's a great time to take advantage of the fact that you're not running that heater element anymore. So now we can switch back over to using the hot liquor tank to start heating that water up because that element is available to go. The last part is cleanup and this mirror polish finish makes it super easy to wipe down. But let's talk about kind of how we clean up. Personally, I like to take the fittings off. I don't like to store standing water in here. I like to flip everything upside down for at least 10, 15 minutes to help drip dry out. On each vessel, make sure I flush my tubing well, make sure I'm running that hot water at the end through the pumps, just to take all that residual sugar out of there. The way you treat your tools, your equipment, it's gonna last longer. So make sure you take it apart, clean it, treat it well. We, it looks beautiful. We want it to stay and continue to look beautiful forever. So yeah, I, I do exactly like Chris does. Uh, sometimes I'll leave it you know, upside down overnight, come in and make it look right in the morning. Uh, but you know, make sure you take everything apart, clean it well, it's gonna last longer and it's gonna last your entire brewing career. I also store everything off the kettle inside of the kettle for storage. That way I know, one, I dealt with it after the last time. Two, there's no places for things to hide or grow or build up that I can't see as I go to assemble it. Three, I like that assembly because I know it's put together right, that it's not potentially you know, misdone or it's gonna leak on me or anything like that. It gives me a chance, kind of like a pre-flight, to just make sure everything is working the way I want it to. Yeah, the nice thing about having each one in its vessel is then you know where they go back together. Another thing I like to do too is um, say, I'll just do like a CIP loop. So I'll get all these valves and things like that, put them in there, start heating that up and do a like, a, 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 not a caustic, but a, a PBW loop and let them soak in there. You could use a bucket or things like that, but soaking them, keep, keep everything clean. Uh, cleanliness is the key to brewing. 
So that's it. That's part two of our series on using the brew sculpture. Vito and I got to brew on it together on this particular one. It was awesome. We had a great time. Yeah, if you have any questions, we missed anything, glossed over anything, let us know in the comments. Uh, any questions about this system in general, be sure to uh, drop it in the comments there. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.